Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Security Pod. I'm your co-host, Jonathan, and you've got your co-host, Brad, as well with us. Hey, everybody. Today, we've got a lot of good uh, points to talk about. Um, we actually, um, we'll get to it a little bit later, but um, our main topics actually submitted by one of our uh, group members on our Facebook group. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun on that topic. A lot of information to go out to everybody. Absolutely. And uh, this is this going to be Brad's time to shine because he knows way more about this subject than I do. Um, so I'm going to probably learn a few things too. And uh, hopefully we all do. Absolutely. I'm definitely going to drop some hints of what we're going to talk about here. Um, but oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, first, we're going to start off with a, a video review. We're going to be looking at a video. Uh, a lot of you might have seen it before. It's, it's actually out of the States, but um, it has a lot of lessons on sort of uh, what not to do. Um, the video is entitled "Female Security Guard Gets a Beatdown from a Biker Chick." <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. And um, it's a bit of an older video too. I believe it's from 2013. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it should be an interesting video. Um, but the the lessons learned still uh, still applicable to today for sure, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, so let's take a look at this video. Are you ready, Brad? I am. All right, let's watch this now. Yeah, maybe you guys need to pay attention because I'm going to take all your cameras. You know what? You need to get out of here. Guess what? What? Me! You have no authority to do that. Yeah, I do. You need to leave. Don't take another step closer. Leave. That's assault. Leave. <laughs> you need to leave. I want you're to friendly. Run. You're all leaving because you're not respecting the Super my friendly. Home. Look at that customer yeah, service. Yeah. She attacked her first. She did. She, I yeah. saw she attacked you first. This, this girl jumped on me. Man. She did. She hit her first. She came over here. She's belligerent. Let go right there. Don't, 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 don't do that. She didn't do nothing. Do that. Stop. Bitch. Oh, we got a second angle here. I didn't notice. Yep. Little mess, but. Uh, did you have it on film or hit her? All right. Well, the, police, the police are going to be 
She grabbed her up first. See, I saw she attacked you first. This, this girl jumped on me. She did. He hit her first. She came over. Okay, right there. Just, just look over. Let go, right there. Don't, 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 don't do that. She didn't do nothing. Do that. Just disengage. When you have the opportunity to. Absolutely. Or are you pulling out your tops? See. Well, she's going to hit you next, buddy. You better watch it. I'll see you. Right. All right. <clears throat> Really goes to show you the guy jumping in at the end, like uh, calm, cool heads always prevail, right? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I mean, definitely an interesting video. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Good, bad, ugly? There, I think there's a few points of uh, you know every side of this. I uh, think. Look at. I think that security officer needs a new job in a different field. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I I personally. Tend to go with the you catch more flies with honey approach yeah same uh, here maybe you know uh, i don't know the uh you know obviously the story on what property they were on or whatnot uh, i'm sure they were on private property if she's coming up to them hopefully yeah. and um, again that's that's something to remember here too right when we look at these videos uh we don't know what led up to this we don't know what oh, the contact is but um and that's, know, it is that's important to, to look at all the facts here right Absolutely, yeah, and that's the thing about pretty much any video you're going to see. Uh, it's important when you're looking at viral videos online. We don't know the whole story. We don't know what led up to it. Uh, all we can do is sort of analyze from what we have in the video, what we've seen. And um, I mean, I, I honestly think that there was that was no way to talk to a group of people. Um, that's at least not um, not a way I would have ever done it. Um, clearly, the emotions got the best of her. Um, from the looks of the video, uh, I, I, I could have missed it. It could have been all angles or whatnot. But from the looks of the video, it does look like she assaulted that patron. Um, oh, and uh, it just, you know, for lack of a better term, she got her ass kicked. And um, she, there's a time where you're like, you need to realize, look, first off, it shouldn't have got to there in the first place, but it did. Um, so from there, you can only make, try to make better decisions than the ones you made beforehand. And when the guy's trying to pry him apart, don't pull out your cuffs. You're not going to affect an arrest at this point. No, uh, no. And also, what are you arresting for? For you assaulting them? I mean, yeah, there's trespassing. But I, then again, that's, that's in the States. I don't know the trespass laws there. Obviously, here in Ontario, we're blessed with the Trespass and Property Act being written the way it is, uh, giving yes. us powers. But uh, I know some other provinces, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the other provinces don't have. So... Um, I guess I'm a little coddled, um, but uh, we are a little lucky here in Ontario for that reason. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, geez, that was terrible. What What do you have to say for it? Uh, yeah, I mean, from you know the officer safety perspective, you've got uh, I think I counted eight or nine other people there. Um, you're vastly outnumbered, and you're picking fights with people. Um, all it takes is for you to push that one wrong button. And, uh, you know, the crowd is already not favoring your situation or, or whatever it is you're trying to advocate for. Can't say um, I blame them. You know, yeah, I mean, ab absolutely, right? Absolutely. Her customer service was, was very poor. Again, we don't know what the context or situation was here. Uh, or, I mean, frankly, what she was protecting. It looked like a big, open, empty field. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, you got consider um what rights to privacy do you have out in the middle of nowhere or is there out, out in a public setting at the side of the road right you know? so there, think, there's a few factors to look into in that regards when it comes to filming uh whatnot again that's yeah. my perspective but uh absolutely i think i think what it may have been again i don't know maybe there's just like a beautiful outlook <laughs> you know over uh, so. maybe and uh, probably they were standing on mall property or, or whatnot. And uh, sure. clearly, if, if they're gathering there, you know, it, she might not have seen them as patrons of the mall since, you know, obviously, they, maybe they're not going into the mall. But, you know, there's ways to talk to people, you know, hey, guys, like, first off, maybe I'm just very lenient. <laughs> I generally don't bother with something like that unless I'm told to, and then I'll address it. But 
I have a very specific way I address it, you know, like, like I've always said, you know, you just, if it, it's not in the grand scheme of things, it's not entirely a big deal. They're not hurting people. Right. No. But if you do have to, you know, ask them to move or whatnot, you don't have to make it sound like, like that was almost like almost <laughs> very emotional, like, um, verbal commands, essentially, you need to leave, oh, you need to leave, uh, you know, turn off your camera, erase the pictures. <laughs> By the way, I've never seen someone ever say that. And someone being like, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, no. and <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that, like, uh, I've had property managers tell me to go tell people to stop filming, stop taking photographs. Yeah. Um, I worked on properties where, um, you know, there are some very high secure clients in the building. Yeah, there's yeah. there's a way to approach those people. Um, you know, hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to the property. Blah blah blah. Just to let you guys know, you can't film here. If I could ask you to just put the cameras away, thanks. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So, and and the way you come off on it, you know, it's you're you're more you're asking them essentially, and yeah. you know, then you know, usually people don't feel so defensive when you're instead of you telling people uh to stop filming or whatnot it's there's it's, there's a way you go about it right so if, if I'm, i feel like someone's yelling at me telling me what to do uh you know i don't i don't entirely blame them for going all defensive of course uh yeah you know, in the end of the day it's it was a really unfortunate situation um i really hope she doesn't work in security or at least if she does maybe a site for her with, benefit too, right absolutely I mean, yeah uh given you know given what happened, um, you know, and I, I hate, I hate to see anybody get assaulted on camera. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. She had a really bad attitude. Um, do I think that she deserved to get uh, assaulted and get into a fight? I, I don't, I mean, yes, don't get me wrong. Yeah. She totally provoked that fight. She went hands on first, but at, at one point you can tell that she had lost control and now was, you know, being assaulted herself. Yeah, and that's one way street, right? Absolutely, and that's one important thing when uh, when doing the job. Is no matter where you are, uh, keep yourself in control. I know sometimes yeah. there's situations that you can't control in terms of the situation, but at least control the way you act and the way you um, uh, behave in the situation. Right? Clearly, that that was a time where uh, that was a moment where she uh, lost control, at least of her emotions. Um, and, uh, you know, like, obviously I don't want her to be hurt. Um, I, like you said, Brad, for her own benefit, uh, you know, I, I hope if she's either not in security, if she is still in the security field, at least maybe in a site with less, uh, public interaction, perhaps, yeah. uh, you know, CCTV monitoring or whatnot. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, um, there's, there's a lot of things that could definitely be said about that video. Um, I'll basically wrap this up with, um, you know, you, and as you mentioned, right, you can really only control yourself. Uh, you can influence other people, but at the end of the day, all you can control is you and your behaviors, right? So yeah. um, think about how you're going to influence people to either cooperate with the rules or um, follow the rules on the property. Yeah. Uh, take leadership, right? People tend to uh, follow uh, if they can be led. And, uh, you know, yeah. there's a lot going on there. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so we're gonna move on to our, our main topic of the video. Uh, wanna give a quick shout out to um, our group member on the CSPN uh, Facebook group who actually uh, came up with the idea for this topic today. It's uh, Cole Nethercott. I hope you said I said your name right. Uh, he's been a very active member in our group. He's been posting uh, different posts uh, and starting discussions. And honestly, yeah. uh, Cole, if you're listening to this, I hope you are because you, you sort of wanted us to cover this. So I hope you'd listen to it. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you are. Uh, you know, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your um, your devotion to the group and uh, you know engaging conversation. And at the end of the day, that's that's why we created the group. This is for people yeah. to talk, exchange uh, you know ideas and uh, and perspectives. And uh, he's he's really great for that. So uh, with that said, today's topic is actually about vests. Um, I just realized I don't have. Uh, exactly what he said as a question popped up here. So I'm just going to quickly find it. Uh, Brad, if you don't mind uh, chatting with our fine viewers while I look for it. So uh, we're going to talk about body armor today. Um, as uh, I think a lot of people know, there are uh, a, a 
lot of different types of vests out there. We're going to cover uh, different aspects of, um, I, I guess, the uh, the standard out there. I think a lot of people are familiar with the NIJ standard, but uh, we're going to go a little bit more in depth, explain what the NIJ standard is, how the testing works, um, and uh, hopefully get you in the mindset. If uh, you're in the market for body armor, hopefully we can kind of point you in the right direction um, with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's essentially pretty much took the words right out of Cole's mouth there. Yeah, so it's possible to talk about body armor, the different levels, reputable brands that you uh, would recommend, uh, not necessarily just for security, but also if you're going to go to a firearms range for safety and practice. Um, yeah. In terms for the firearms uh, firearms range, um, probably won't get too much in that because I've personally uh, very limited time on the range. And um, every time I've personally gone the range, I haven't worn a vest. And, but, um, you know... I'm sure it's not an issue, um, you know, for your own safety. Yeah, I, I can I can touch on that real quick too Absolutely. while we're sort of on the topic. Um, I do belong to a, a club. I even worked uh, part-time at a club nearby uh, as an instructor. Um, I, I know there's a few clubs out there that they uh, mandate that their staff wear body armor, but uh, it's typically not something that the shooter is gonna wear um most backstops are designed to deflect up and into a uh, a caveat up there or to be able to uh essentially disintegrate um through uh, terminal velocity when the uh, projectile hits the backstop uh flybacks do happen i have been to a couple of ranges where flybacks happen i have uh oh, it's not on my desk right now but i uh i did get hit once pretty badly with a nine millimeter that uh, was a flyback um hit me in the leg, cut my pants open, was bleeding all right. It wasn't, wasn't terrible, wasn't too great either, but... Um, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, you know... I had a real, great time. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic time. Always a fantastic time at the range, though. Um, yeah, I mean, wearing body armor at the range, not a terrible idea, but uh, would I say it's absolutely necessary? Not, not really at a modern, well-maintained range, so... Yeah, hopefully that answers your question in regards to that, though. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I hope so. <laughs> cool. Uh, what, what aspect of this do you want to go into first? I, there's, uh, it's a big question. There's a lot going on there. Hey, um, you're you're the expert on the fire uh, on the uh, body armor. I uh, honestly, I'm probably not going to be all too useful um, okay. in terms okay. of this topic here. I I, I wear what I'm issued <laughs> essentially. Uh, although I, I do have a nice carrier here, uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, okay. But um, all I can say is Brad's the body armor man, so he's the body armor guru, I would say. Um, so all maybe right. I'm hyping you up a lot, so uh, don't disappoint anyone. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we're all familiar with the NIJ standard. Uh, if not, you've probably read it there somewhere. It's essentially the National Institute for Justice in the United States. Uh, something to understand, that's an American standard. Uh, we have adopted that here in Canada. That's great. But there are other standards out there. There's the uh, VPAM armor standard, which is a, uh, a European standard uh, through the EU. There is the TR armor standard. That's a German uh, standard. There's the HOSDP standard. Uh, that's from the United Kingdom. And there is the uh, GOST armor standard. It's a Russian standard. And lastly, there's the uh, U.S. military armor standard, which supersedes the uh, the NIJ thing. Um, but you know what? Um, I, I can't imagine anybody has a, uh, a vest from any one of those places. I do, but uh, I don't know anyone else who does. So we're going to stick with the NIJ standard. We're going to sort of talk about that. Uh, something to understand. A couple of years ago, they were looking at revamping the NIJ standard. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, is current as of this date being uh, the 15th of April, 2021. Uh, if you're watching this four years down the road, uh, who knows? Who knows? I think most people are familiar with your, your level uh, 2 and 3A body armor. There are some other brands out there or uh, levels. So we'll start at the very bottom. Your level 1 armor typically covers your, your 22 long rifle, 380 ACP, um, uh, 38 round nose. Uh, when we're looking at those particular projectiles, there's other measurements that go along with it. 
including the uh, the weight and size of the projectile and how far away the projectile is being fired. Now, level one is a defunct standard. They don't make it anymore. They don't test for it anymore. Uh, if you have a level one vest, it's probably 40 plus years old. Probably not a great idea to keep using. And a new one. <laughs> Get a new one, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, now, with that being said, level 2A is the uh, the current standard, the lowest level in the NIJ program. Um, it covers your average uh, 9 millimeter projectile, 40 caliber, and 45 ACP. Uh, now, for reference for you guys, <clears throat> this here is a 9 millimeter inert projectile or bullet, just to give you some frame of reference. Just how big these bullets are. This is your 40 caliber. Okay, again, not that big. And uh, just for reference, this is roughly a 22 here. Okay. Tiny. So, not only does it project or protect you from those, you want to consider what types of projectiles they are. Uh, your nine millimeter will be. Um, uh, with the level two is uh, going to protect you from full metal jacket round nose. Your 40 and 45 at the level two A will protect you from um, full metal jacket rounds. Okay. Moving along, level two is uh, pretty common with uh, most police services here in this country. Um, level two also covers your 2A. So your level two is a little bit more of an advanced. Um, uh, protective layer, so it projects you from uh, nine millimeter plus P, which is a really hot nine millimeter round. Uh, it's coming out of the the muzzle a lot faster, as well as three fifty seven Magnum. Um, moving along, your level three A. Uh, I think this is what a lot of people have. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Three A covers uh, three fifty seven uh, Sig, which is actually a fairly rare round, and uh, forty four Magnum. Okay. Moving along here, we have uh, level three covers most rifles, uh, seven six two by five one NATO round. Um, with that, with the level three standard, they only fire at the uh, the round once, or sorry, at the uh, the protect on the panel once. That's it. So it's only rated for uh, one shot. Standard, essentially, yeah, they only test it for one shot. Okay. So while your vest might take one round from a forty four mag, that's great. They don't test to see if it'll take a second one. That's the NIJ standard, okay? And uh, lastly, uh, we have type four, that's your uh, armor piercing 30 on six round. Again, they only test it once. So they're gonna take that uh, level four plate, put it down range, hit it once with a 30 on six, and uh, that's it, okay? Uh, so that's basically how the levels work um, in regards to what they will protect you from. Sorry? Said so just got on my phone here in case anyone's wondering why I'm looking down just to follow along. Yeah. Yeah. Um the, the stuff is publicly available if you want to Google the uh the NIJ standard. It, it's out there uh and it gets into a little bit more detail as well that'll explain uh you know feet per second and uh the distance. My understanding uh is the minimum distance that they fire at the um the protect panel is 10 meters. Uh, which is, you know, usually your average street engagement. Uh, so that being said, you might have a, a level 3A vest and uh, be shot at from about four feet away. It may not protect you because it's not tested from that distance. It'll protect you from at least that 10 meter mark and anything past that. Okay, so something to, to understand there. Now, something else to think about. What is the NIJ standard? So. It's a standard that exists uh, and it also sets out legal precedent and rules if you're going to follow it. So with that said, I have a whole bunch of protective panels right here next to me. I'm gonna bring a bunch of them out and kind of show you what's on them. This is a panel from Survival Armor. So we'll start with this one for a reason, okay? You'll see on the, uh, the label here, it's got an NIJ sticker, okay? If your vest, doesn't have that very specific logo right here, your vest is not NIJ certified. Okay. Something else to throw out here. We've got the model, we've got the size. So you see here, this isn't just a standard small, medium, large vest. This is a custom fit vest to me. Uh, this vest fits 
me, it doesn't really fit other people unless they were about the same size and uh, dimension as I am. Moving along here, you'll see there's a serial number that is unique to this piece, as well as a lot number. And I'll explain the lot number here in a little bit what that means, because it is very important to have on this tag. I've got the location of manufacture, date of manufacture, and the, the declared five-year warranty. We'll talk about that here in a little bit as well. And lastly, the threat level down here. So this is a level two vest. Uh, this is a Kevlar vest with level two. You'll see it's fairly, um, fairly malleable, flexible. It's fairly lightweight. Um, it's very comfortable to wear all day long. Doesn't breathe very well, but um, you know, this is a pretty good vest to have. With that being said, up here another panel. So this is from a company called Compass Armor. Compass Armor is a Chinese company. This vest here is uh, rated to 3A. Now, looking at the sticker here, you don't see uh, a lot of what was on the other uh, the tag. There's no NIJ standard. This is not a legal certified vest. What you'll notice it does say though, this armor fully complies with the National Institute of Justice standard for all worksman, worksmanship, labeling, and performance requirements. So essentially they've taken the test, replicated it, and set it certified. Okay, so it's something you kind of got away yourself here, right? Um, personally, I would prefer to have a legitimate certified vest that uh, if it fails, that company can be held legally responsible and um, there's repercussions for that. Not so with this one, because again, it's not legally certified. Now I mentioned the lot number. You'll also see this doesn't have any kind of a lot number on the uh, the tag here anywhere. So a serial number. America. There's no way to tag it. So the lot number is really important. If I'm wearing a vest that fails, um, <clears throat> and uh, the first thing that they're going to want to do is go, why did this vest fail? Uh, so PSP, which is uh, where I've gotten a couple of my vests from, PSP is the only uh, manufacturer in this country that has an NIJ certification. Uh, all of their products are NIJ certified. So if you're here in Canada looking to buy a vest, uh, PSP is your, your only option if you want a proper NIJ certified vest. Um, run you about seven, 800 bucks to get a good high quality vest. It's not bad. I've had vests by PSP. They are Sorry? fantastic. I said I, I've had vests by PSP. They are absolutely fantastic. They're oh, absolutely. Their absolutely. fit is better than just about any other vest I've been issued. Uh, yep. Their carrier is actually really nice too. Uh, well, very well made carriers. Um, I would highly recommend them for sure. Yeah. So the lot number is important. If I get hit with the, the armor on and the vest fails, they're going to look up that lot number first. That's the, the big thing here. Every vest that they've sold with that lot number is going to get pulled in and new armor will be issued to those people. Okay. So they're making this stuff from a big cut of cloth. If this particular vest here fails, there's no way to, to track down the other ones. Kind of scary when you think about it, right? Um, there's also different types of armor out there. So if you're familiar with Kevlar, this is also a Kevlar vest, as is the first one. There's also something called a polyethylene uh, armor, okay? It's more plastic. You'll see it, it doesn't... Like I'm really forcing it to bend here. This is basically plastics. Um, the uh, the benefit here with these uh, these plastic polyethylene vests is they provide a little bit better protection compared to Kevlar, and uh, you get something called back face signature, back face deformation. So when the projectile hits the vest, it forces it to flex inward. Okay, you get a lot less of that with the polyethylene vests compared to the Kevlar. So you're getting less uh, sort of that blunt force trauma, I guess, exactly. essentially. With it. Exactly, right. Uh, the Kevlar is really good for spreading that out. Yeah. Uh, the, the, here's the interesting thing with that. People have been shot with, uh, with their armor on, and the, their armor has protected them from, from the projectile, but the back force uh, signature is what kills them. It's the, yeah. uh, that blunt force trauma, right? Yeah. So it's something you got to kind of think about, and I'll, I'll get into why, how you could avoid that here shortly. It's not like okay. the movies where you sort of uh, 
get shot and you're like, ha. Yeah, no. <laughs> Not like that at all. <laughs> no, no. Um, if you if you get shot, it's like getting hit with a ton of bricks, and you're probably gonna find yourself on the ground gasping for air. Um, I know people have been shot with armor on. Um that back force defamation can break bones, causing all kinds of other internal injuries. Uh, it's just preventing the projectile from going into you. So don't think you'll be walking away without being checked out by a medic at the very, very least. Absolutely. Okay? Polyethylene armor. Again, not totally legit armor. Again, we're missing the um, NIJ certification there. Now, you might be going, well, okay, you know, I can't afford to buy a, a PSP vest, but I can afford to buy compass armor. At least with compass armor, it's been properly tested and you have uh, you have a tag to work with. And the NIJ standard requires that that tag is affixed and uh, at least tells you what's up with that uh, armor. Here we have an example with nothing. It's got absolutely nothing on here except for something called wear face. Uh, I would not trust this. I have no idea what's in here. Um, I'm not even sure it's technically in, what level it is, right? Uh, apparently, it's 3A, according to uh, where this was pro procured from. Okay. Um, for everybody's sake, I'm going to throw out the, uh, the retailer. Uh, there's a company here in uh, just outside of Toronto in Richmond Hill called Can Armor. If you go to Can Armor's store, they're located in the back of a pawn shop. That should probably be your first tip off that this isn't really the best place to be buying body armor from. Um, with that being said, this is can armor armor. It doesn't have any stickers. There's nothing on it, nothing. Um, I do know they are being investigated by the RCMP for this armor because it does not meet any legal standards. And uh, this, this puts people at risk. This absolutely puts people at risk. If you have a can armor vest, uh, start asking questions. Where, why, why? I've got a bunch of these fake panels. We've cut them open, and there really is very little ballistic protection properties in here. Uh, something that makes it look thick. There's a foam pad in here for some reason. Okay, huh. the problem with that foam pad is it's going to allow that back face deformation. Okay? Yeah. So I mentioned sizing. Sizing is also something to consider. This is the vest that I'm currently using. This is a Molly vest. Uh, this is a PSP vest that is inside of a uh, LOF defense carrier. Um, sizing is important. This vest is sized to fit me nearly exactly to a T. Okay. When I wear this and I wear it properly, it uh, flexes right up against my skin. It needs to be worn nice and tight and snugly. If you're not wearing your armor right up tightly against your skin, that's where you get that back face deformation. Okay, so your armor needs to be worn properly, appropriately. It needs to fit you properly. Um, now, I'm not saying cinch it down so you can't breathe. It's got to be flexible to a degree, uh, and it needs to be comfortable for all day wear. But, you know, I see a lot of people that uh, their vests are way too big, way too small, um, and it's a problem. It's, it's a big problem. At the very least, if you're going to wear armor, go with size smaller because it's definitely going to uh, eliminate that back face deformation, right? Yeah, sure, it's going to miss out on protecting vital areas, but uh, the, the whole point of the vest is to protect uh, vital organs, and uh, you don't want to die from trauma where uh, the projectile didn't go inside of you. Wouldn't be a good day at all. Absolutely not. Um, now, with that said, too, carrier options. We have all kinds of carrier options, right? So what's becoming a little more popular these days are Molly vests. Okay, this is great. Gives you a lot of opportunities to carry extra gear, first aid kits, tourniquets. Yep. Um, even John here, I can see he's got pens uh, in the Molly slots. Got Nothing wrong with that. It works. Yeah. Right. It works. Okay. Yeah, it's just the top pocket's a little too shallow to. Uh... Yeah, no, I know. I have a vest like that too. It's it's a little wonky. Yeah. Uh, there's also concealable vests. Okay, so this vest is cut a little bit differently, uh, and you'll see it's got absolutely no pockets. Um, this is designed to be worn under a shirt, 
and to be a little bit more covert, okay? Uh, these have benefits. Now, I know a lot of younger guys, they're like, no, I want the tactical vest. I want the molly. I want to look cool. This is actually safer. This will do its job better than the molly one will. Uh, if the vest is not worn tightly and close up to your skin, back face deformation happens, okay? Uh, you would not get much back face deformation out of this vest because it would be worn pretty much up against your skin, usually with a t-shirt in between, and that would be about it. Yeah, I, Whereas uh, with a, a, a molly vest, you may have uh, you know a couple of shirts and then a sweater over top, allowing for that back face deformation. Yeah, I could, I could, uh, I could attest to that for sure. I've uh, worked uh, oh, here. some plain clothes uh, duties, um, obviously while doing security. Where um, obviously it was loss prevention. I don't have my PI license, so um, and uh, we were issued uh, internal uh, vests. And uh, I, once in a while, honestly, I could, I could be a little uh, guilty of not wearing my vest as, as tight as it should be, just because of comfort. And I probably should, but you know. Um, but when it comes to the uh, internal vest, yeah, that thing is skin tight because if you don't put it on tight, it just looks like you're wearing a giant barrel underneath you and it just looks stupid. Um, yeah. Definitely with the shirt underneath, uh, I've seen people, um, I've, I've heard of people that uh, that decided to try to wear no shirt underneath. And um, I don't know if anyone's seen that episode of uh, from The Office where uh, Andy goes for that marathon run and his nipples start to bleed. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, your nipples are going to have a very hard, bad time. Um, yes, but um, whatever shirt you're wearing underneath, just uh, be prepared for it to be absolutely disgusting when you take it off. Uh, but it, it is worn uh, tighter to the body and uh, still kind of look like you're wearing a barrel, depending on how what clothes you're wearing. Um, but but it's it's uh, it's a good thing to have for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'll um, show my carrier here. Uh, just the, yeah, go uh, ahead. No, that's that's great. Yeah, so this one's a Safe Life Defense carrier. I've actually put the uh, the patches that it came with uh, on just because I, I took off my company patches and my security license number and all that stuff. You guys don't need to know that. Um, so um, so what I've got here actually is I need to buy a Narcan case, Molly Narcan case. This is actually a cuff oh. case. I've got two uh, two uh, things of uh, Narcan in here. Um, obviously with uh, you know, the opioid crisis, it's, it's um, probably a smart idea, not just for you to help others, but uh, most importantly, in the event that you're dealing with the situation, you get cross-contaminated with uh, fentanyl or another type of opioid. This can help save your life, hopefully. Um, got my uh, cat uh, tourniquet here. I've got it in a closed case. Um, I also have this 1110 case. I love both, I've worn both. Um, the only gripe I have with this is the fact that this Velcro is exposed. I've yeah. had it scratch up my arm. Uh, I've had it, uh, I've had it <laughs> tear up the inside of a, a nice, uh, uniform jacket I had, uh, just the, like the type of, uh, material I had in that uniform jacket did not take too much of a life than that. Um, and then I've got here is my Leatherman wave. So, um, I'll get into this a little bit, but I'm going to pull this up for now. And then I've got a pen, no book. And uh, this, I would highly honestly recommend, I know we're not on the gear review part yet, but I, I love gear. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> um, anyone that carries, uh, that drives a vehicle while working, I would highly recommend getting a rescue me tool. So this just clips onto my vest up here. In the event of an accident, um, I can just pull this off. It actually takes a decent amount of force. I've never had to fall off during work. What we've got here is actually a seatbelt cutter and nice. a window punch so you can just press that into the obviously it's not a window but you press it in and then you press it's gonna punch through the window um never had to use it thankfully but it's there just in case um on the back is uh, i've got some more molly I've actually got a sort of a drag strap personally uh, my personal nice. preference i would actually prefer not have molly in the back or the drag strap uh, although I do really like this carrier, I just have my issue plates in here uh, from my employer. But uh, I do, I do really like this, um, this carrier, and I'm I'm really fortunate that my employer lets me uh, wear this. Uh, I just find it very comfortable. So, so yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Very nice vest. We like the vest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So I showed off my Molly vest. I showed off this concealable guy. I got one more to sort of show off here. This is my uh, vest that I wear when I'm teaching. 
this is from a company that no longer, unfortunately, makes vests. But uh, if you're in the Durham area or familiar with Durham Regional Police, this vest may look kind of familiar to you. Uh, this is basically the vest that they use. Um, you might be asking me, hey, Brad, I'm, I'm looking at buying armor. What would you suggest? Now, context is important. You know, you got to ask yourself, what is it that you're doing? Uh, what are your needs? Uh, you know, are, are you required to wear internal armor, external armor? Those are things to start with. Are you allowed to wear a molly vest? Are you not? That's um, a big thing. Some employers don't like that. Yeah. Um, I, I know some see it as a more of a tactical look and, and it can be. Um, yeah. But I, I, the way I see it is you're taking gear off what would be on your belt and putting it up on your yeah. chest, uh, on your vest. And it's, uh, it is more comfortable. Uh, I, I'm, I try to be a minimalist in terms of what I carry on my belt. And, uh, you know, things I can put on my vest, I will. Um, just because, you know, uh, we've, we've all heard about the back problems that, you know, yeah. uh, not necessarily us per se, but I mean, it can happen depending on the amount of gear. But police officers, they carry a, decent, a lot of gear and it weighs a lot. Um, you know, I've, it's, it's, it's in the end of the day, you got to take care of yourself. you got your back, you know. <laughs> No matter you know however long you're gonna be at a job like you're gonna be stuck with your back for <laughs> the rest of your life right um so if, if you're allowed to wear a molly vest i would i would recommend it personally um just uh you know um wear what needs to be worn on your uniform uh i've seen a lot of people i've heard this term for batman belt syndrome well yeah turns out there's now batman vest syndrome too i've seen people with uh with a specific hard belt case for their tactical pen <laughs> wow. yeah so wow, wow. i i don't even know what to say to that because yeah. uh, i am i am absolutely guilty of being a uh, gear guy so uh, wow that's that's overkill that's yeah overkill. <laughs> it, like you know i i'm all for being well equipped but you know uh, be realistic on what you're going to equip yourself with um, absolutely Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, consider consider what kind of a cut of a vest you need, internal, external, uh, and then from there you got to really ask yourself what kind of threat level do I need. Um, now, I'm sure people are listening to this going, oh, oh, I have 3A because it's you know it's the best soft armor you can get out there. I mean, yeah, sure that's true, but uh, why do you need 3A armor? You got to ask yourself that. Um, it, it is it is incredibly rare that the police are recovering 44 magnums out on the street. They're just not out there. Uh, they're not viable. Uh, they're not effective. Gangbangers aren't interested in them. Um, 357 SIG, again, that's a very incredibly rare round. Uh, I belong to a gun club. I don't know a single shooter at my club who even owns one. Um, it is a very, very rare round. Um, when I worked at the range part-time, uh, we didn't have one on our gun cart. And uh, I don't recall ever selling a box of 357 SIG to anybody. It's, it's incredibly rare. Uh, what you're going to be concerned about though, out there is your, your 22 long rifle. Uh, yes, it is a popular cartridge for those gangbangers because it's very easy to get. You can get a Canadian tire, you can get it anywhere. Uh, nine millimeter, nine millimeter plus P is out there and uh, 38, 357. Those are the threats that you genuinely want to be concerned about. Yeah. Um, Generally, I, see people, generally see people uh, when they're those uh, when you know when there's shootings like that. It's either I find it's either Glocks or high points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. That uh, that nine millimeter and uh, three fifty seven, even forty cal is becoming a little bit more popular. Those are your threats that you want to be concerned about. Um, if your employer is issuing you three A, hey, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're thinking, hey, you know, I'm I'm going to go buy myself a three A vest. Um, you're spending more money than you probably need to for protection that you're not going to get the use out of. Um, yes, it will protect you from the, uh, the level two and level two A threats, but, you know, save yourself the, uh, the back trouble, save yourself the, uh, the weight of the vest and save yourself a few bucks. Um, if you're asking yourself, Hey, should I buy rifle plates? You got to ask yourself, do you face rifle threats? I mean, hey, if you're a security contractor in Iraq, 
Yeah, yeah, buy, buy rifle plates. Absolutely, yeah. If you're working at uh, Darlington Nuclear, Pickering Nuclear, or something like that, sure, buy rifle plates. Um, if you're not working in those environments, I can't imagine that you're facing any type of serious rifle threat. Um, and with that, I would suggest level two. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I've been clear on this. I'll sort of wrap this up with this. Absolutely. Um, if you're going to buy armor, PSP, guys, go to PSP. I know there are people in here that'll tell you safe life defense all day, all day long. I have nothing against them. I don't know where they stand in regards to being a legit NIJ standard uh, certified brand. From what I understand, from what I understand, they just got their NIJ certification. Uh, they they okay. no little while better. without it. Um, okay. People still bought their products. They liked it, but I, I know that uh, they finally went and uh, actually, uh, from what I understand, is what they said, obtained the uh, certification or uh, simply because there were people that were purchasing it not because it wasn't uh, yeah, yeah. certified. And that's something to think about too. Um, getting that NIJ standard certification, it's not easy. It's, it's a very, very, very expensive process for a company to go through. Uh, and that's why so many of these companies don't do it. Um, so again, uh, PSP is the only company in this country that has that certification. So if you are buying armor from any other Canadian retailer, uh, it is not NIJ certified. It might be tested the same way. It's not certified. So with that being said, uh, anything else you want to add there? I know we went uh, down quite the deep rabbit hole. And yeah, I definitely. You know, uh, in, the end of the, in the end of the day, the, um, the decision's yours, right? Uh, this is just our opinion, right? Uh, obviously, Brad is very, very well versed in this uh, over, I, over myself. Uh, but, you know, it is something you don't want to cheap out on. Uh, I would highly recommend um, investing in your own vest if, if you're allowed to wear it um, at work. Um, it's all obviously uh, ensuring that you uh, follow your company policy. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you, <laughs> if you ever do have to use it, per se, as in get shot, you really, really want it to work, right? You don't want to, you don't want to risk that. That's, that's one of those, it's, you know, yeah. it's just as important as, you know, like a, a cat tourniquet really, or, or a soft tea or, you know, a reputable um, tourniquet brand, right? Uh, vest fails, you might die. This fails, you might die, right? So it's, it's a, there are certain things that I understand cheaping out on a bit, and cheaping out on them will will result in an inconvenience at most. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, we're cheaping out on a vest. I'm not going to bring it up because I'm lazy. Um, you know, can result in you dying, and you know that's that's terrible. So, um, you know, definitely if you have the ability to purchase your own vest, definitely look at the reputable, uh, um, uh, you know, reputable manufacturers like like brad said psp um from what i've seen pretty much most police services i've encountered use psp for that reason right uh you know toronto police auto police uh, uh peel you know ev like everyone from what i've seen um, their their prices aren't unreasonable either like i i myself have this vest here i purchased with my own money it's not unreasonable of a cost uh, I, I want to say it was somewhere in the $700 range. Um, yeah. You know, and with that said, I, I think that's comparable to Safe Life Armor. I think that's comparable to uh, a few of the other places out there. Yep. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I know I was going to say something else there, but it, it's totally escaped me. Um, oh, yeah. very, very lastly on the topic there. Uh, if you're going to buy armor, try to get it sized to you. I would suggest staying away from any, uh, you know, standardized, small, medium, large. Um, you want to make sure that it fits you and, and not a bunch of other people. Um, yeah, with that, I'll zip it and we'll uh, move <laughs> along. Well, I, I hope I hope Cole's very happy with, that, with the, the information we've given him there. Hopefully, yeah, that answers your question. I hope it does. Um, and, you know, if you have other questions on the topic, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah. Um, if I can't answer it all, uh, I'll find you somebody who will. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we've got coming up next is story time. So 
one of our favorite uh, times of the day or night or evening or whenever you're watching this video. It's currently <laughs> evening at the time we're filming it. Um, who wants to start? Do you want to start, Brad? You want me to start? Yeah, yeah I'll start. Um, so unlike the last episode, uh, I, have, I have a much more positive story um, that doesn't involve anything sticky. Uh, if you watch the last episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to wipe off my face this time. Uh, so <laughs> going back a few years ago, I used to be a director of security at a, a large property downtown. Um, part of my responsibility was uh, supervising the supervisory team. So uh, with that, I had to go and do audits once in a while, right, on, on the whole shift. And uh, it was just for KPIs. Anyway, there's one particular day. It was a few weeks just before Christmas, if I recall correctly. Um, I had to go in and, and do an audit on the night shift. Now, again, as the director, I'm a day shift guy. Um, you know, it is what it is. But uh, I decided, well, the, the easiest way to do this and still work my day is to just go in super early. Um, so I got up really, really early, went to work for four in the morning, um, uh. spent four hours. Yeah, it was a brutal <laughs> day. Spent four hours with the night shift. Um, we did our thing. I took the guys out for breakfast at the end of it. Uh, easy peasy, right? Uh, I go about my whole day because I still have to work my, uh, my day shift. And uh, just about at the end of the day, I get a phone call from the, uh, the afternoon shift guy. And uh, he tells me, hey, man, uh, hey, Hansi, <laughs> uh, not feeling well. Um, I, I can't make it in today. So I'm, I'm looking at my watch and it's like, oh man, it's a half an hour on a Friday nonetheless. It's a half an hour before I'm supposed to go, before he's supposed to be here. Um, I don't have any notice. And uh, it's the one day of the week where I can't get the night shift guy or the swing shift guy to come in because it was a, a flip switch for them. So I figured ah, it's, it's, it's on me. So whatever, no biggie. Stayed for another eight hours. Um, worked a 16, well, 16 hours plus four hours. So worked a 20 hour day. Um, oh, sounds lovely. <laughs> oh, it was just beautiful. Um, I was, I was beat by the end of the day. Um, midnight rolls around the swing shift supervisor shows up and, uh, he's telling me, Oh, Hey, uh, good to see you. It's uh, so-and-so's last day here. And I thought, Whoa, well, you know, they've been here forever let's do something for them so yeah. we ordered some pizza pre-covid of course um the loss down the street was still open so uh, i sent somebody down we got a cake and um we had a little bit of a going away party i think i hung out till about 1 30 with everybody and uh, i thought okay uh, it's, it's time to go home because i don't know if i'll make it home because it's like an hour long drive for me so uh, I'm, I'm walking out of the security office towards the parking garage and I see this lady walking towards me. She comes out of the parking garage. Um, she looks pretty upset. So uh, I said, hey, is everything okay? And uh, she tells me, hey, I can't find my car anywhere. So I said, oh, well, you know, my name's Brad. I'm the director of security here. I can definitely help you with that. Um, do you remember where you parked? So she tells me she parked in A7. I think most people, uh, and John, you'd probably assume that would be like the spot number, right? Yeah. Yeah, our parking garage doesn't have anything like that. We don't we don't number our spots. So I'm thinking, yeah. good chance you're not parked in our building, but uh, you know, doesn't mean I can't do something to help you out here. Yeah. So got her plate number. She knew her plate number. Uh, we have something at this property called an LPR camera at the entrance. So I uh, checked the uh, checked the camera. Uh, we had no record of her vehicle coming in or out. The camera only works about. 60% of the time though. So I thought, you know what, let's go into the garage and uh, let's see if we can jog your memory a little bit. So uh, we started in the garage. We went all the way down to the bottom floor uh, and her car was nowhere to be found. So I thought to ask her, okay, well, you know, when you were pulling into the building, what do you remember seeing? So she recalled this restaurant that's on the other side of the complex. We actually have another garage over there. So I thought, oh, you're just parked over there. Let's go over there and check it out. So we walked that whole garage, nothing. She definitely not parked in our complex. So from there, I thought, you know what? Let's um, 
let's uh, go up into the path and see if we can wander the path. I was getting her to sort of, you know, jog her memory a little bit, explain to me what she saw. We went through a few of the other different um, complexes in the downtown core that uh, neighbored our complex. And uh, about two and a half hours later, we uh, found her car parked safely in spot A7 where she said she parked it. Right, pretty good story. Now, it's not quite where the story ends though. Um, oh. Yeah, I. It's, it's well into the middle of the night now. Um, I had to walk past the security office to get uh, to my car uh, where I left it. And uh, the guys in the office see me walking by and like, well, you're still here, man. So I explained to them what happened. And uh, they're like, oh, go home. I went home. Uh, I didn't realize that the uh, the supervisor on duty thought that that was a really admirable thing to do. So he sent an email to management, which, you know, I appreciate. I had no idea. I went home, went about my weekend. Um, interesting thing about this, though, is the person that I helped. Uh, she's actually a radio host for uh, CHFI, oh. a major radio station in Toronto. Okay. When the morning rolls around, she's on the morning show. And she spent 45 minutes talking about Brad, the director of security at this very specific property downtown. And that I had spent many hours helping her find her car unrelentlessly, right? Yeah. And um, lo and behold, I guess a bunch of, um, you know, vice presidents and senior executives for this very particular, very large company were also listening to her talk about this on the radio. Monday morning rolls around. I've completely forgotten about this. So I'm going about my morning um, and I'm getting all kinds of weird people calling me. I'm looking at my call display. I'm like, that guy's an executive. He, why would he be calling me? And I thought, well, it's Monday morning. I got a whole bunch of nothing that I need to do right now. Yeah. That call can wait. Right. Trying to choke down my coffee, trying to choke down my breakfast, shooting shit with the guys. And um, my boss sort of strolls into my office and he's like, you need to get over to this office. They want to see you right now. As the executives, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I make my way up there a few minutes later thinking, oh man, I'm in a lot of trouble. Why did they what did I do? Me? Right. And that's all I could think about was yeah. I did something really, really bad. If those guys want to see me, I am, I'm done. And I'm thinking, man, just before Christmas, I'm going to get fired. This is terrible. Yeah. So uh, I walked in and uh, they had this really long board table. They're all seated at one end. And there's a seat at the very other end for me. And they're like, take a seat, Mr. Berzowski. Okay. I sit down at the end of the table, uh, way far away from everyone else. And uh, the guy, he's got the sheet of paper of me in front of him. And he looks up at me and he's like, do you know a Mrs. Insert name here? Because I'm not going to throw out her name. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea who that is. And I'm trying to think about any of the incidents that have happened on the property lately. Yeah. I'm like, Man, was that the robbery victim? Is that the person that the, the slip, trip, and fall? Yeah. Uh, I'm spinning my wheels trying to think about it. And uh, yeah, long story short, they ended up coming out. Well, do you remember helping some lady find her car? And I'm like, yeah, no big deal. So that, well, we wanted to reward you. So, uh, hey, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, for lack of a better term, so they felt the need to make you essentially shit your pants first before. They decide to tell you, <laughs> okay, they, just want to make sure. Yeah. Were, and they did a fantastic job of it. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, because I'm pretty sure I saw somebody go, what is that? That was me. It was my pants. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, they gave me a, a gift card from okay. the property management company with a very substantial amount of money on it um, because it was free advertising for them on the radio at the end of the day. Oh, nice. Right? Okay. Yeah, I got a very substantial uh, sized gift card, which I haven't used either. <laughs> <That'd> use anyway, <laughs> my first thought, I've got this gift card and I'm like, oh, I got to do something for my guys. So uh, I go down to Tim Hortons in the uh, the concourse, I get in line and uh, I get all the way up to the front and I'm like, guys, I want to buy everything. I want all of your donuts, uh, all the pop, like all the muffins, oh, give me everything. Um, I get like that too, like, but it's usually just for me. Yeah, they were like, oh, just your usual order, Brad? I'm like, yeah. So um, the, the, the lady in the back, she's like, woo, we're closing early today. Yeah. So uh, they're like, it, it'll be about an hour to put everything together. So I'm like, no problem. Uh, I'll be back. Uh, I come back an hour later. 
and uh, they've got everything in big garbage bags for me to take uh, back to the office. And they're like, yeah. so how would you like to pay? So I busted out the gift card and I'm like, oh, the, uh, the gift card. Oh, we don't take that here. Uh, will that be Visa? I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, $380 later. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the, the guys had uh, some food for the shit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's my customer service story. Um, you know, something to think about. You never know who you're helping, right? Yeah. Uh, and as I've mentioned, I think in the last episode, uh, the job is all about helping people and solving problems. Uh, yeah. Be genuine about it. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it was great. I, I get to tell this fun story once in a while, but uh, I feel pretty good about helping that lady out. It was, it was nice. Oh, I absolutely. Had some chit chat with just some member of the public. It was the uh, best part of my day, to be honest. Yeah. And and that's that's why I love when I'm when I'm working. Uh, I really try to work in places where I deal with the public. I love dealing with, the, you know, talking to people like even though generally on the show, we're going to be talking about, you know, mostly dealing with incidents and sort of you know when things occur but remember a, a large portion of the job is to be able to chat with people you know talk to people um you'll notice even though you're wearing a uniform to security it'll either it'll, it'll people will read it as the information center the yep. hey just come talk to me uh and you know what like i've some of the best conversations i've had i are were completely i didn't ask for you know i'll walk uh, you know i'm just standing there right some some shifts you get a little bored right so you just stand there and you're just looking around and someone will come talk to you and there's really interesting people you know i'm uh personally i'm a huge watch fanatic and um i would probably spend a lot more uh than a healthy amount on a watch and probably enough for a lot most people think i'm crazy <laughs> including my girlfriend uh and uh I hear but you. Like, I'm when sure. I'm working, I, o I always only wear my Apple watch. I don't wear any of my like, nicer watches, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting seeing someone with like, there's obviously a watch that's out of my budget, but um, I would like to, you know, purchase someday. But I, I recognize, you know, like, oh, uh, is that a Rolex GMT Master? And it's like, is it like, you know, and like, they're kind of surprised uh, that like, they're seeing a security guard, you know, ask him about something like that, or uh, my Grail watch personally, an Omega Speedmaster, right? So, you know, it's very interesting. I've, uh, yeah, I, I really want that one. That one's flown, uh, flown on the Apollo missions, a uh, huge space nerd here. I won't get into oh, that, nice. because it'll, uh, but funny enough, actually right up here, is a drawing I did on the Omega Speedmaster. Um, Very nice. Thanks. Very nice. So, but yeah, you know, you could have some really interesting conversations that you wouldn't normally, uh, I would say, think you would, right? So I, I you know, it's, uh, that's the thing I love about dealing with the public. There's, there's so many different types of people out there, some pretty bad, but at the same time, there's a lot of different people with different knowledge and perspectives and i've you know it's uh it's really nice i really much enjoy that that's probably one of my favorite parts of the job yeah absolutely all right so for no i got my story still <laughs> that's right um so my story has a small it's gonna be fairly short um and it's gonna have a little bit of a lesson <laughs> So uh, back in 2015, there was an event. I was working for a small security company here in Ottawa. Uh, obviously, I won't mention their name. Uh, but uh, I was working, I was asked to be a supervisor for an event uh, that um, had music, uh, spray painting, a bunch of different stuff. Alcohol was being served. I was told oh. to be the supervisor. I know, the alcohol. <gasps> Um, the devil's juice. <laughs> um, and I was going to be supervisor for the security team, which I was honestly really stoked. Um, it was one of my uh, first uh, supervisor roles. Um, since then, I've had very many supervisor roles along with uh, management experience. But uh, it was one of my first supervisor roles. Actually, I think it was my first like actual supervisor role. Um, oh, nice. <clears throat> and. Um, yeah, so what happened was um, I was told there's going to be, you know, this many guards. I was actually told there's going to be eight guards for this event. I remember now. Um, and there was a decent amount of people. Uh, and this event happened in the south of Ottawa. And I remember showing up and having three, three guards, myself being one of them. Supervisor, two guards. Uh, one was a, a guard that I've, I've worked with before. Uh, fairly decent guy. Um, you know, him and I understand how to work with each other um, uh, during events like this. So good guy. 
Uh, the third one, there was a huge language barrier. Not, he was a good guy, though. Unfortunately, oh, sure. it was just very difficult to understand what he was saying. So we explained, you know, part of our training, we explained, uh, you know, basic 10 codes and stuff. But honestly, thinking of it now, probably shouldn't have. <laughs> we had radios. I think it would have been better just to use plain English just because of uh, yeah. sort of what occurred later on. Um, so the guard um, was, uh, we had one guard, which was the, uh, um, the, um, the guard with the language barrier who was stationed at the door. He, he wanted to work that spot and he, uh, uh, he seemed to understand the concept of, uh, of working that, uh, that specific sp position there. Uh, there was also regular event staff that were checking IDs as well. He was just sort of the oversight there. Um, and then my, uh, myself and, uh, the other guard, uh, my partner was, uh, were, uh, roving patrol and okay. also keeping an eye on the, uh, the beer tent. Um, cause we had people that were trying to get in and, uh, who were underage and stuff like that. So we, we had to deal with a few, few issues of that. Um, but quickly it became very out of hand. Um, as the night went on, people became more and more, um, uh, under the influence of alcohol, as, as I say. So, you know, the things that drunk people will do. Um, Brad proceeds to drink, but. It's just Diet Coke, I promise. Diet Coke, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and we're gonna drink. <laughs> That's vanilla Coke in there. I love vanilla Coke. Um, so good, I haven't had that in years. Yeah, I have, uh, Walmart sells it, I've noticed lately. Ooh, yeah. All right. <laughs> um, so essentially what happened was um, we get a radio call that uh, if a lot of you are familiar, they probably never want to hear over the radio. Uh, someone yelling 1078 over the radio. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, 1078 essentially means officer needs assistance. Um, I know 10 codes are generally very different between police services and security. Uh, and also different security companies and sites, but 1078 is generally pretty universal, uh, at least I've seen in Canada. Um, so, you know, um, the guard and I, um, hearing that, run over and uh, we're sprinting because we figured this guy needs help. Um, there he is just staying there, clear as day, just like, hey, I uh, just want to use the bathroom real quick. Uh, can, can you let me use the bathroom? Oh. Um, so unfortunately, so we explained to him why we, you just ask, you know, ask us, hey, can you come to the front? You don't have to use the 10 codes. Honestly, if you don't, you know, uh, obviously a lot of places, some places do implement uh, the 10 codes, uh, which I find helps on certain situations. But I always say, if you just don't remember that specific 10 code, plain English works just fine. As the, the reason for the 10 code I find is, um, a quick way to mention something, right? Um, or also um, just being discreet over the radio. So, so you know, I, I generally, because um, I feel like I'm probably next to death or something, <laughs> I always wear, I generally wear an earpiece when, I'm, uh, when I have a radio on, uh, just so I can hear better and just so people aren't hearing the radio traffic. Um, but um, some people don't. And, you know, you're hearing certain things like, um, uh, for instance, you know, I'll use a, a more of a policing term. So uh, if I remember correctly, obviously I'm not a police officer. I don't remember warrants and all that stuff, but I think it's 1063 is warrant, warrant uh, having a warrant or, and 1060 is negative no. CMI. Yeah. A negative result. So what would sound better if I'm standing in front of someone who has a warrant? Uh, yes, this guy has a warrant or yeah, your subject's 1063. 1063 for sure. Yeah. So unless this person's been arrested many times and knows what the 10 codes are, which there are people out there like that. Um, but for the most part, that's, that's sort of a, a good example I find of, of why, um, um, why 10 codes uh, sort of exist. Um, but if you don't know, them, English works fine, right? Yeah. I'd rather, you know, in the end of the day, you're just trying to get this information across the radio if you're, you know, so people need, need to understand you. So, you know, we let him know, you know, uh, just ask for us, maybe not use 1078. Um, unfortunately, um, it was used a couple more times that night uh, by the same guard. 
very nice guy. We went to get McDonald's after. It was a very tiring night. Um, but uh, yeah, so what ended up occurring was essentially we had the crowd got wilder. And with the three of us, we couldn't handle we couldn't handle it at all. Uh, people were trying to jump up on the stage. We were, uh, there was a certain like a barricade, uh, sort of like, you know, those short barricades, I guess. And I was standing hey. there, stupid me, had one of my hands on like the railings and some guy decides to just stomp on my hand. Uh, yeah. And um, that hurt. <laughs> um, I was going to run after the guy, but he disappeared into the crowd. And me, like I lost him seconds after he, uh, that happened. So I had to, I had to get ice on my hand. I remember the other guard, uh, he actually snapped a photo. If I can find the photo, I'll attach it to this video. Um, I don't look very impressed. <laughs> I'll tell you that, but, uh, yeah, I've got a little like, uh, ice pack or something on my hand and, uh, yeah, it wasn't great. And honestly that night we ended up, um, I believe we had to call the police, uh, to sort of help mitigate this because it was out of hand. Um, you know, I could, I, I know what I'm able to handle and with that many people and us being three guards, one of which, um, was also very new to security at fine. So he, he was very uncomfortable dealing with a lot of situations. And obviously I don't want to make him, um, work in situations where he's feels unsafe. Right. Um, yeah. so in the end of the day, it almost felt like, uh, it was just myself and my, uh, my partner there. Uh, I mean, in the end of the day, we did the best we could, but, um, I, you know, with it being one of my um, first supervisor roles, I did not want to call the owner of the company and say, hey, uh, I did let him know there was only three guards. He said that was fine. Uh, but I did not want to tell him that, hey, something needs to be done. I can't handle this. Um, you know, obviously it must have been a pride thing. Um, I am uh, like to think I'm wiser now. <laughs> um, but uh, back then, you know, I don't want to be the, the supervisor that failed, uh, you know, with this event there. But uh, the moral of the story is if you're really understaffed like that and you're in a supervisor role, or if you're, even if you're a guard role and you happen to observe it, mention it. it this needs to be mentioned. It needs to be mentioned to, you know, at least documented, right? In the event something yeah. happens, someone gets hurt, uh, you know, you don't want to be held liable. Obviously, you want to make sure um, that the employer does everything they can do to keep their guards safe and to make sure this event is actually properly uh, protected. Um, I mean, I understand budgets, there's, there's budgets and there's, you know, guards cost money and all that stuff, but it is really important to, to take a look at like, Hey, do we need a second guard here? Do we need a third, yeah. you know? Um, so that's, that's essentially my moral of the story. Don't be afraid to speak up when something like that happens. Um, in the end, in the end of the day, it's, it's your safety and it's the safety of your safety, your coworkers' safety and the safety of the people that you're protecting uh, at this property event, whatnot. Um, just because, you know, if there's only three of you, say all three of you are dealing with an incident. If you're not properly staffed, that means you've got no one else to deal with the event. Someone gets hurt, uh, especially like a medical, um, you know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad news. Uh, the only really good thing um, about that day I find was, um, I got to pet a really, really cute dog. It was, he was just chilling. And honestly, everyone who, who knows me uh, personally knows that I, it, dogs are like my vice. Like I, I will stop um, pretty much anything I'm doing to go see a dog, pet a dog. Yeah. That's awesome. I love dogs. I don't even have a dog. I recently moved to, well, like last November to a bigger place so I can get a dog. It hasn't happened yet, but eventually. And um, I'll definitely bring the dog onto this uh, podcast too, for sure. <laughs> that's awesome yeah so anything you want to have to say about uh, my uh, fun loving uh story yeah no that's a good story um i know in the past when um you know I've, I've spent most of my career on the management side too in various supervisory management roles um i know there have been times where either i was new to the role new to the organization uh etc and i was really nervous to go okay like this is not a good situation i am not set up for success here um, but you know, I was scared to death to say anything because it was, you know, are my superiors not going to see that I'm capable of running this? Yeah. Um, you know, having been in this industry, as long as I have, I know a lot of people are very much of the mindset that, uh, uh, do with what you have and try to do more with less. It's a bad attitude to 
wow, that's a terrible attitude to have. It puts people at risk. It's dangerous. But um, I get that it exists, right? Yeah. Um, having, you know, more years on now, and uh, I, I think I've become a little more humble and see the other side of things. Um, I have no problem advocating for, for guards in that, that fashion. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I get it. it. It is a tough predicament to be in. So um, I've definitely been there too. So I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really fortunate where I am now to, to work at a position where, you know, I've, I have excellent coworkers and I have, I, I have supervisors and managers that definitely speak up when they think that there might be a, yep. you know, uh, more, more staff should be needed. Um, I really enjoy about that, uh, you know, uh, really, really appreciate that. You know, I've had incidents occur where, you know, my manager asked, hey, mentally, are you okay, right? And, and uh, I mean, I was okay, um, but, you know, um, I appreciate that he asked for sure. Um, I, I find not a lot of people ask and sort of, you know, make sure their staff are, are okay with, with what they're given, right? So. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had people ask, but uh, I know uh, in a couple of instances, the, uh, the asking was not very genuine. It was very obvious. Yeah. Is, you know, the other side of that too, right? So it was hard stuff. But uh, yeah, it's great when you have leadership that uh, genuinely does their job and they genuinely uh, do care about their people. So yeah, absolutely. One hands down. This episode, we're going to be talking about uh, online training for the Youth Criminal Justice Act, YCJA. Um, if you do not know what that is, you and you're working in for one the security field or at least, you know, uh, environment where you're dealing with the public, where you may have to affect arrest, where you have to deal with children, you really should learn this. And uh, even if you already do know this, know what that means. pardon? If you carry handcuffs, you should know what that means. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Um, even if you already do know this, I highly recommend this course. Um, so it's it's from the, uh, the Justice Education Society of British Columbia. You can... Uh, you can take this on, this is taken online. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you're in British Columbia or not. And it's, it's a course essentially through the uh, Justice Education Society. Um, I'm reading the certificate here. Um, um, that goes through the YCGA and it does, uh, it has uh, different sections for, I believe, uh, law enforcement as well too, right? So you sort of uh, see it from a law enforcement, uh, I guess, perspective, perspective which, uh, which is great. Um, and Honestly, having, uh, I did this course back in February of this year and having done security for the past eight years, uh, honestly, I learned stuff. There was stuff that I, I learned from that course that, uh, that I, maybe I should have known, uh, while I was, you know, uh, years ago, obviously, you know, I've, um, I've worked loss prevention. I've worked, uh, jobs where I've, I've affected arrest on youth and, um, Things, things are different when you're dealing with the children, uh, with, with the children, uh, with youth, right? So it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that protect them. Uh, you know, children are obviously, or youth uh, rather, are obviously uh, different on, uh, you know, sort of their mental capacity as well and their rights and, you know, parental, you know, having their parents present, stuff like that. So it's really important to learn that. Um, so you get a nice spiffy certificate here. Um, just, uh, uh, covered up my real uh, last name here, but uh, yeah, you got to nice. get that. Pardon? Very nice. Very yeah. Nice. So um, nice little certificate add into your resume. Um, I highly recommend taking the course. It is free. So, you know, if you're, if you're in this group, uh, our Facebook group, or if you're watching this show, you clearly care about bettering yourself as a security professional. So, um, so do it. It's free, right? Uh, didn't take too long. Um, and honestly, you know, being, being educated in that sort of, uh, area is really, really important. Uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of liability when it comes to dealing, uh, with, well, with any situation, uh, but along, especially youth, um, you really need to make sure things are done correctly. Um, there's a lot of different laws, uh, that are there to protect, uh, protect, uh, children. So that's all I have to say about that. Well, it's, it's well said. Um, as you know, I've taken the same course, uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I took the, the law enforcement perspective of it as, uh, being on the law enforcement side. Um, 
I'm not going to get into what I do, but for those of you that know, I do work in uh, an area, a very specific area of the courts, and I do need to be very familiar with criminal law and youth criminal justice act. Um, it was handy for me. I, I learned things that um, I knew were out there, but it reinforced a lot. I, I know I learned things that I wasn't really on the up and up and low. So even for a guy like me, it was a very, very useful course. So um, absolutely. Yeah. If you're looking for free training opportunity, guys, free training opportunity. I think I wrapped the whole course up in, I think in the evening all online it was very easy to do. Yeah. So yeah. But, uh, yeah. Gear. 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 Your gear, my gear. I'll, I'll start. Okay. I'll start. So uh, I feel silly kind of showing this off because uh, I don't want to be like the flashlight guy, but I think I'm gonna you're going to be the flashlight guy. guy I'm telling you. Yeah, damn. <laughs> so uh, I have another flashlight to show off here. Um, you probably haven't seen a light like this. This is a little bit different. This is from a company called uh, First Light USA. They have a few different models of lights like this, but this is basically the uh, crook neck light or a 90 degree angle light. Um, what's different about this? It's got this little uh, slide on here. Um, the mount is on my vest. You can get a couple of different mounts. It slides into the mount and uh, the whole flashlight stays exposed. Uh, you can rotate it around while it's in its holster. Um, you can get a belt holster, which is great. You can plop this on your belt, turn it around. There's a safety beacon. I'll show you the yeah. different lighting feature here in a moment. Um, I like to keep it on my vest. It sits horizontally this way and I can angle it down towards my memo book or uh, whatever I'm doing in the dark and uh, in the car at night. Uh, and there are so many lighting opportunities with this. You'll see it's got a little ring for your finger, which means you can still operate your hands, hands free with the light. That's pretty cool actually. Uh, the bottom has a UV light, uh, which is great for, uh, you know, checking IDs, uh, checking banknotes and whatnot. Not checking um, public washrooms. Not checking hotel rooms um, when you've checked into an out-of-town hotel room, <laughs> which I always enjoy doing, actually. Um, you'll see here the top has been mangled a little bit. Uh, originally, when I got this, a nice black uh, rubber finish on there. Um, I originally was wearing this on my duty belt, and uh, the top of my vest rubbed it off. So that was the downside. Uh, I contacted First Light USA and they've actually solved that problem and told me oh. they would warranty this many, many years later. I'm just too lazy to send it in. I really like this light and I don't like being without it. And that's why I haven't done it. I might do it one of these days though, because this is a really cool light. Okay. Um, so lighting functions, it's got 700 lumens max. Uh, the little button here on the bottom kind of looks like a smiley face if you look closely enough. Uh, that big U switch there, that's just that's temporary. lit up on. your room, holy crap. <laughs> oh yeah, pretty bright. Yeah. Uh, and then you got other options here. So on the outside ring, we have uh, different multicolored LEDs. Okay. Okay. Um, I have it set up for green and orange. That's... And super again, set them up for different things, right? Uh, green and orange is great for medical situations. A lot of you guys know I'm into the medical stuff. Um, this is very handy for identifying blood and bodily fluids in the dark. Okay. On the other side, we have white, just plain old white light. Okay. Uh, out of a high powered, uh, I think it's a Cree LED. If you're a flashlight guy, you'll know what that is. And again, different intensities of light. Um, if you push down on the uh, smiley face and uh, this guy, you get strobe, which I probably hard to tell on camera there. And uh, lastly, we have the emergency beacon. An SOS. Red, white, and blue strobing very oh. high intensively. Again, oh. hard to tell on camera. Yeah. But uh, yeah, pretty cool little light. Um, quick fun story for this. Uh, myself and one of the other admins were in a vehicle that uh, the alternator had died on in the, the darkest section of the 400 highway uh, north of Toronto. Uh, we had nothing to illuminate this black SUV on the side of a very blacked out area of the 400. So I thought, well, hey, I've got 
I've got this little light. So we plop this down on the bumper with the emergency beacon going. Yeah. And we sat in the car. And it was great because everybody gave us the lane next to us because okay. you have to yield to red, white, and blue lights. Uh, about 20 minutes later, I see behind me, there's a whole bunch of flashing red, white, and blue lights coming flying up the highway. And uh, I nearly got this taken away by the OPP. Uh, they were really cool about it. I explained uh, who I was and what was up. And they were like, hey, as long as you're not using it to pull cars over, we'll let you keep it. But uh, you can't use that. So they decided to sit there and uh, leave their lights on until the tow truck got there, which was also okay. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I got one other really quick light I'll show off. Sure. That goes sort of in conjunction with this. Definitely not flashlight, man, for sure. No, oh, definitely not. <laughs> it's called a, a little Larry. Kind of looks like a little bit of a weird light. This thing is great. I have it sitting on my Molly vest face out. And you basically get this wall of light. That's really Absolutely fun. fantastic. Um, it's great for when you get people trying to record you. Just turn it on. It illuminates everything. It's designed to be a floodlight, right? So if you know how a floodlight works, you've got yeah. your floodlight, and then you've got your spotlight. So they go together really well for that reason. Yeah. Um, the little Lebo has uh, three different modes, high and low, and then a uh, red strobe. So, yeah. In fact, uh, first time I actually saw someone with that type of light on their Molly was like last year. It was my, uh, my old boss. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, oh, it's, it's sort of like hand little tree and you know what? light projected forward, right? So it's, uh, yeah. that is really cool. This guy is very expensive. I'll say that now. If you want information on it, PM me, I'll send it to you. You can get these at almost any hardware store or outdoor store for like 10 bucks. Okay. So nice. there you go. All right. So thank you, Flashlight Man, once again. Um, definitely going to make a meme out of that later. <laughs> I put Flashlight Guy at the bottom when, uh, you know, you're editing this. <laughs> yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm there doing, actually. <laughs> um, so what I've got here is a multi tool I carry uh, when I'm working. I actually have one in red, uh, red, uh, black, and one in uh, silver, I guess. Um, so this is the Leatherman Wave. I'll show it to you like that. There you go. Um, and uh, obviously, a lot of people know know about Leatherman. And uh, this is the one I carry. I absolutely love it. It's you know, it's uh, got the pliers here. Um, got, you know, Leatherman's or multi-tools in general, I would highly recommend actually to carry when working uh, just because there's so many things you can, you can do with them. Um, I'm also someone that carries a knife too, uh, obviously not def for defense or anything, mostly just loose threads, but, um, you know, they're tools and they're really, really, really um, useful tools. So right here we've got um, as well, you know, we've got scissors. Um, they're honestly not too bad. I pretty much never use them though, uh, just because I do carry Leatherman Raptors, um, the, the shears there. So I'm just gonna pull out everything we've got here. Uh, we've got a mini, um, there we go, screwdriver. So we've got a Phillips head here and flat head. Once you just flip it over and put it in correctly. There you go. So you've got that. So it, you're able to change it out. Next, you've got a a thing that won't come out. Apparently, here we go. Um, hey, gear guy, what is this? <laughs> that is supposed to be a pry bar. Okay. Very light prying tasks. I, have I also have a, a leather <laughs> wave. Okay. Yeah. So, wave. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely love the wave. Uh, I used to work at a tactical store that sold uh, essentially Leatherman's entire line of products. So I, I got to, um, you know, take a look at pretty much everything that they, they had. Sorry, maybe not Leatherman's entire line, but mostly, you know, most of their multi-tools. And this was the yeah. one I sort of decided on. Right. So, uh, obviously a bottle opener and, uh, this be a can opener too, I guess. So, you can cancel that. Yeah. Um, a larger um, um, screwdriver head, which also flips over to a flathead. So that's what you yeah. got on you the can actually do a, a bit kit with those two, eh? 
So you get a little sleeve that has all kinds of different bits that go in there. Oh yeah. I never got one with mine. <laughs> or you have to, you have oh, to purchase it or? Yeah, you can get them online. Um, oh, okay. Like most of the stores, they've, they've got them. I've got a whole bunch of them around here somewhere. That's really neat actually. Uh, Got here, uh, you know, a serrated uh, knife here, blade, serrated blade. Um, inside here, uh, your little mini, I guess, handsaw. <laughs> yep. Um, and the other side, uh, your more straight blade. Uh, one thing I, I'll say about these, <laughs> these are ridiculously sharp. Uh, Leatherman, they don't play around with the sharpness of their blades. Uh, you know, don't. Um, I have admittedly cut myself a couple times just because I was not, uh, you know, <laughs> careful. Um, on this, uh, you've got a file, um, got a more coarse one, and uh, it's got a bit of black on it because I, apparently I've used it at some point. Uh, more coarse one, uh, more coarse side. So that's what you've got on that. And honestly, I absolutely love it. It's very easy to use. Um, I've also got a bit of a little, it's hard to see right up on the camera so if you see those little lines there that's uh those are inches so you've got a little ruler and then uh, on the other side you've got centimeters so it's it's really nice to have uh yeah there's centimeters okay <laughs> i thought it wasn't uh yeah um it's really nice to have that i i love carrying this i've got uh this one uh this one primarily is carried in my vest at work and then i've got another one that's in my uh 511 rush 12 backpack um very nice. For whenever I go out, you know, hiking uh, in the woods, any any of that stuff, sort of sort of like an EDC bag there. Um, so yeah, that's I absolutely love that. Um, before I continue on, I also have a few couple of things I just got today that I want to show. I just think these are really cool. So I got these patches from uh, Pathfinder EDC or Pathfinder Tactical. Um, so I got three patches. So I've got this one. This is really really cool. Um, it's a uh, Full color patch. It's hard to see, but there's actually a lot of detail um, in this patch. And I'm going to see if I can try to show you this. Give me a sec. This is about to get real dark. I turn off the light. All right. So I'm going to hold this up into this light right here. This is the worst lighting <laughs> lighting uh, anyone's ever seen yet. And uh, this is on the full color patch. But what you'll see here is it actually glows uh, in the dark. It's hard to see, but it's it's there. Um, the little ridges, which is, uh, it's like a topographical uh, ridges. It's really, really cool. Turn that light back on. Um, I absolutely love this patch. I'm going to put this on, uh, you know, on my, on my bag. I've also got this beautiful one right here. It's a uh, sort of like a green, flat, dark earth, tan sort of patch here. Uh, this one's going to probably go on my, uh, my multicam uh, 511 Rush 12. And then I've got a uh, you know, tactical subdued pathfinder tactical patch. I think these are really cool. Um, I love patches. I've got a small collection of different agencies, different security companies I work for, uh, and uh, and then just cool morale patches. So I, I really think that's a cool patch. I just got it today. So I'm just awesome. uh, just want to show it off. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, while we're on the the multi tool thing, I won't totally dive into mine here, but. Uh, if you're looking at Leatherman and you can't pick between a blacked out, uh, like the black oxide finish or the, I think it's nickel or silver, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you get what's called a hybrid. Oh. So this is a two finish one. Uh, so all the tools are blacked out. Kind of hard to tell, but uh, this is the Surge. I also okay. have a wave like you have yeah. uh, in this finish as well. So you'll see again. Uh, all nickel or satin or whatever the heck it's called, and then uh, like all the tools are totally blacked out. That's really cool, actually. I would have, I would have gladly yeah. chose that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is that um, the one, or is it the wingman? Is that the one with the spring-loaded fires, or is, or is it? I know the no, wingman. that's the that's the OHT. OHT, okay. Yeah. Um, eh. <laughs> I I just found like on my black ones, I find sometimes. Uh, pulling them apart it's uh yeah a little I, I agree um and just for me like i'm a gear guy um and a bunch of people know that if you're looking at leatherman's uh, my suggestion with the wave great tool surge is basically a big wave uh the charge 
uh, TTI is a, probably the best one you can get out there. It's sort of an in the middle ground in between the two of them. Um, or the MUT, those are the ones I would recommend for duty work. Um, yeah. yeah. The Raptor's oh, really nice too. Raptor's, absolutely. I carry a set of Raptor's. Yeah. So yeah. I've got, uh, Can't go wrong with a set of Raptor's. Nope. Um, yeah, so. definitely really handy. Comes with a nice little clip. Um, you were mentioning uh, yeah, ride before. Uh, there's uh, one that could fit on the duty belt, which is what I have, but there's also one, I guess, that could fit on Molly. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to go dig in through my pile of stuff here, but uh, there are two um, two holster attachments. Okay. Um, you know what? Give me a second. I'll pull it out. I'm pretty sure it's right here. Or maybe it's not. Um, you try to see the the bottom part where it comes down, if it sort of sits flush with where the bottom of the, the pouch itself is, uh, that's the belt one. Uh, the one where it comes down much longer, those are the Molly ones. Yeah, if you uh, if you join our Facebook group, we actually have mentioned, uh, spoke about it in the group. So uh, hint, hint, yeah. nudge, nudge, uh, a lot of great information. Uh, in that said, there is a photo posted with both holsters. Uh, exactly. I think I added both in the photo, so. Absolutely. If, uh, if you need a photo reference, there's a photo in the group. Yeah. Is there yeah. anything else you want to uh, uh, mention uh, while we're on this before we close out? Uh, no, gear wise, yeah, no, I, I think I'm done with flashlights for a little while. You're not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, probably not. But uh, yeah. Okay. Probably not. All right. Well, with that said, we're going to close out our second episode of uh, the Security Pod. If you, if you understand the, the name there, podcast, pod. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So, Great name. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're closing out the second episode of the Security Pod. Um, you know, you can always follow our, our uh, Facebook page, which is uh, uh, the Canadian Security Professionals Network. Um, if you have any uh, comments or, uh, or questions that, uh, that you have for us or any topic suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at cspnconnect at gmail.com. Um, of course, you can also join our Facebook group. That's the Canadian Security Professionals Network. A lot of uh, still, still around 400 something, I guess. Um, we're going strong. Uh, a lot of uh, great yeah. engaged members in there. Um, honestly, you know, we're really big on uh, just having people in the group that are willing to learn and better themselves. Uh, you know, in terms of numbers, it doesn't bother me what our numbers are. Uh, it's just, no. I'm I'd, I'd rather have uh, quality over quantity. I mean, if we had Absolutely. a group of 40 people and everybody was active in there, that, I mean, I'm happy with that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're watching this, don't hesitate to jump on the group and ask a question or comment on a thread or, um, you know, we're all here to, to help each other and, and uh, better things, I guess, for the industry. Oh, for sure. And that, that's why we started this podcast is to, sort of uh, bring different opinions and voices and sort of um, bring our combined experience to um, hopefully help you in the security industry. Um, I know we've got some people in the group that are fairly new and uh, they've, they've been taking in all the information they can. Um, you know, uh, one guy recently was looking into becoming a stop the bleed instructor as well, which is great. Uh, he wants to, you know, train his family, his friends, um, his coworkers, right? And, and that's absolutely great. That's, that's what the stop the bleed, you know, model is absolutely know, yeah they want to they want to grow their instructor base as big as they can get it so yeah absolutely absolutely I'm, can't I'm, have too many instructors <laughs> yeah no i'm 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 glad to see an organization wants to do that uh i know there are um i, I won't mention organizations here but i know of one particular in toronto that uh very use of force oriented uh they are very much hands-off when it comes to allowing other people to become instructors. Okay. I, I get the theory why, but, um, you know, the more people that can learn and engage and get certified, uh, the better it is for everybody. So. Absolutely. 100%. I agree. So with that, we're going to close out this, uh, this episode of the security pod. Again, if you have any questions or anything you want to add or say to us, you can email us at cspnconnect at gmail.com. Uh, you can also message us on our page, uh, Canadian Security Professionals Network, and we'll uh, we'll get to that as soon as we can. So with that, uh, have yourselves a good night, everyone. Uh, stay safe, learn lots. Um, you know, I'm really happy you're here because uh, clearly you're, you you care about learning. 
and um, we'll be we'll be here uh, next episode to uh, right. hopefully uh, teach you some more. All right. All right. Stay frosty, guys. See you later, everyone.